All right. Hello, hello, friends. Welcome to Deep Learning. Uh, I am Aurora. Uh, and uh, you'll be noticing I'm I'm alone at the moment. Andrew uh, got a little double booked on himself, so he will be joining us. Um, but welcome, welcome to to Deep Learning, uh, usually with Aurora and Andrew. Uh, and today we're doing our second episode uh, for if you were with us a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we did a really fun discussion and talk about taking your Battlesnake code and putting it on your resume. Uh, we figured that was a nice educational topic, a fun, deep dive. And this week, we're going to really take it academic. Uh, so I hope you will join me in this journey as we are going to dig into uh, this topic. And I'm going to put it on the screen because I am no Aileen. I'm no Chris. Um, I have not practiced for weeks the pronunciation. So I'm going to use the shorthand we use in inside the Battlesnake group, which we call this Neater Snake. Uh, so we're going to dive into the research paper behind uh, Neater Snake. So this is going to be talking theory. This is going to be talking machine learning. Uh, so this is very fun. Uh, and I think is a nice style of deep learning topic that we can dive into. Um, so that's the idea behind deep learning. That's what we're going to deep dive today. Um, while I'm here and while we're at the beginning here, I'd love to thank our 2021 um, partners for Battlesnake because they help us make this happen, the, the competitions and our Twitch streaming and all of that. So shout out to AWS, to RBC, to GitHub and to Replit. Uh, who are our fabulous uh, Battlesnake 2021 partners this year. So yay, thank you all of you. <laughs> and um, as, as Deep Learning is still one of our, our new shows, we haven't quite reached the no notoriety of, of say Brad and Joe coding badly. Um, please like type into chat or uh, hop onto Discord. We've got a deep learning channel. We'd love to hear your thoughts or topics or things you would love to talk about. If you have an interesting machine learning problem or snake and you want to talk about it and show it off um, on stream, um, let us know. You know, we can we can find some fun things to talk about and, and dig into. Um, <laughs> when is there a deep learning theme song? Yeah, I know. We need to find something. I don't quite have the slick audio mixing setup that Brad has yet. I'm slowly growing on that. Um, but I do know from the community, the Battlesnake community, there's like a Battlesnake song that has been uh, produced. Uh, and uh, if you haven't checked out the community page, <laughs> uh, give that a listen, because I, I think about that a lot. I think about how, uh, as a community, we can build not only snakes and compete, but also all of the beautiful side stuff around Battlesnake, uh, including hot tunes. Yeah, yeah, it, it works out pretty well. <laughs> Um, cool. So to kick us off, I, I want to sort of like set the tone for deep learning here because um, I have done machine learning in my career in the background in, in the past. Um, but the way I've approached machine learning um, was actually with natural language processing, which is like a very different beast. That's like your k-means algorithms and just like completely different approaches and algorithms and styles than you use in game in game theory. So this is this is like new for me. And I like hard felt this when I started reading this research paper. I was like, yeah, I know, I know a little bit about machine learning. I'm gonna read this academic paper. This is gonna be fine. It's fine. And then I did a whole bunch of reading. Um, and, you know, I learned that I have a lot to learn about <laughs> machine learning with, uh, with games. Um, in fact, I have, this is my like toy. I got myself a remarkable and there's the research paper loaded up on it. And I was just like marking it up and highlighting and like going, being like, okay, I have to look this up. I have to look this up uh, and get into all the details. So I appreciate it in chat. If you know a lot about this topic or you've been thinking about this topic, uh, you know, toss some facts in there. I'll, we'll, we'll happy to talk through this. This is gonna be a learning journey for the both of us. Uh, I would be delighted uh, for that. <laughs> um, I also want to give a quick shout out to Extagon, who is in the chat, I believe. Extagon, when I decided, uh, when Andrew and I were talking and we were like, we want to do this research paper, um, I knew about it from the 2019 Winter Classic, but I didn't have like a link or access. I just knew it existed. Um, but Extagon has been helping curate this like um, Battlesnake Awesome page with an incredible amount of resources. And uh, it was just here, like here's here's some some famous one, Alter Saddles, uh, <laughs> famously uh, talked about on Brad and Joe Coning Badly. Um, there's a whole bunch of like fantastic winners and different snakes available. Um, and I was able to through here find 
in different developer stories, but I was able to find this research paper. So uh, thank you, Extagon. You were a huge help in, in the prep work for this. Um, so I'm very happy. Uh, thank you for taking care of this. And if you would like to contribute, I'm sure Extagon would be delighted to have more contributors helping making this awesome. I mean, we can see here all of our you know, Smallsco, MD Hex Drive, and all the uh, others who have, have uh, contributed as well. Um, yes, shout out to everyone for who's contributed all these things to this list. Yeah, it's a great list. I benefited from it. I'm sure others will too. Sweet. Okay. So um, if you haven't met me before, um, I'm Aurora. I'm one of the developers on the Battlesnake team. And um, at this point, I would like to give you a reason like why you should listen to me. And really, at the end of the day, um, I don't actually have a ton of background in game theory machine learning specifically. So this is a new topic for me, um, and I'm excited to dig into it. But as I said before, I have done a little bit of machine learning application in the past in like different areas and technology fields. Um, and I... Um, uh, I, you know, I enjoy reading the odd research paper. You can kind of get into it when you don't have to. That's <laughs> that's a huge, like, I don't know if anyone else feels that way, but like reading academic papers or like even a bit of a textbook or learning something, just it's a lot less pressure when you're not in a school or educational setting. Um, so I, I definitely enjoyed going through this at my slow and leisurely pace. Um, if you're interested in finding the conference paper for yourself, and I'll drop this link. So here, here's the link, and I'll drop this in chat right now. Um, so you can find the research paper. It is totally publicly available here. And it's also worth noting there's a companion um, GitHub repo. So this, this paper was presented at a conference, um, and there's the companion GitHub repository to go along with it. Um, so worth noting that this is from the from 2019. Um, so this is definitely API v0. So you're not going to be like forking this and, and using it out of the box if you if you want to try to take this knowledge. And this has also been very obviously pared down for the research paper. Um, so they, they, they talk about um, what is included, what is not included. Um, but it's all pretty much in there. So let's let's get the GitHub GitHub repo link in uh, chat as well. Do. Yeah, yeah, actually gone like me reading a research paper. Mm, some of these words, I definitely wrote like that's a $10 word <laughs> in a couple of places on this. I was like, I gotta look that up. Um, but it's okay. Like I know how to Wikipedia Google. This is fine. This is this is a skill that I've cultivated over many years. Um, and I have no shame in doing that now on stream uh, together with you all. So we will learn stuff together. That's what deep learning is all about. Cool. Um, but yeah, so here here you can find um, the research or sorry, the the um, GitHub repo that goes along with the research paper, which was fun. Um, so we can see right here. Um, so .NET Core SDK. So this is a C++ uh, snake um, and a strategy. So at a high level, um, they're using game tree search, uh, game, tea, game tree search. There we go, <laughs> um, which is a, 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 a specific implementation of min-max that they have done, which is popular and very common in game theory. Um, and if you're kind of thinking like, oh, is this a place to harvest ideas? Is this a place to harvest like good strategy? I'm gonna go ahead and say yes, because uh, Neater Snake has done very well over the past couple of years. Um, in 2019, um, in I believe it was Stay Home and Code was the event, I believe. Um, they came second in the intermediate division. So that was that's like the right era for when this paper was published and this this code repo is in history. So second is pretty dang good in intermediate. Um, but they also hit veteran, sorry, oh, oh, that was at the Victoria Battlesnakes. My apologies. That was at the in-person Victoria event was where they did that. Uh, and then at Stay Home and Code in 2020, they hit veteran quarterfinals. They were elite top four, so elite level here, uh, in the Battlesnake Winter Classic uh, in 2020. Uh, they came first at the uh, Battlesnake Saskatchewan event. And let's see, let's see where they are, because they are definitely entered right now in Spring League. Let's take a look here. Look at this Spring League, hey, folks, with the, these 188 developers and these almost 260,000 games played. This is this is great stuff. So here we go. Here's here's Neater Snake right here, number two on the leaderboard, uh, platinum level. I mean, this is this is some pretty good stuff. We've got a C++ aggressive area control tag snake. 
Oh yeah, we should watch if you need your spring. I'm going to uh, queue one up here. I mean, I think we we can't go wrong here. A 74% win rate. That is that is excellent. <laughs> that is a truly excellent uh, win rate. Um, and let's just see. Let's see. Should we? Let's watch a victory game, and then we will watch a loss game so that we can understand. Because clearly, this is what we need to we need to learn. So let's take a look at this game here. I'm no Curtis, uh, but if we kind of pop through this neater neater improvisal, oh man, these go for a little while. Okay, nice, nice, nice. So just popping this back a little bit. I mean, that's pretty that's pretty clean. We got a little bit of a tail follow here. I mean, Prusy, what happened here? Why did you go that way? Woof, woof. That was trouble. That was trouble. It should have gone down. <laughs> should have gone down about here. Um, but like just really calm, really cool, doing a little bit of board control, filling that. I mean, that's that's some of the things that I saw in the paper that they were kind of intending to do was to try and, and get a bit of that board control. Um, pitted against coding badly to watch the mayhem. I don't know. I don't know. Can can Brad and Joe's little hearts take that? That's I don't <laughs> I think they know where they stand in the rankings. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and yeah, good in the competitive 1v1. And that's something that really comes up as well. And we'll dig into that a little bit as we start talking about their algorithm and the decisions they make. Um, because I found that really interesting. Their strategy uh, changes, actually, depending on how many snakes are on the board. And um, from what I've read, I have every reason to believe that Neater Snake is, is in 1v1. That is its element, uh, for sure. Um, now, worth noting here, like we're looking, this is a couple of years have gone by. So what we're going to be reading about and the secrets we are going to be unearthing from this publicly published research paper um, is a foundation. I'm sure things have changed. Any code that we look at is kind of from the past. Uh, so someone's going to have to get in contact uh, with the team working on Neater Snake if we want to unlock more modern secrets, uh, assuming they even uh, are, are willing to share that. So let's see. Let's see a defeat. Let's see a defeat so we can kind of see maybe get a hint of where its weakness is. Pretzel. Oh, pretzel. We've been talking about pretzel uh, in the work, Battlesnake work slack. Uh, pretzel is an intimidating foe. Here we go. So filling, not like not getting too hungry. What's going to happen here? Oh, geez. Oh, geez. Okay. So what happened? So just, yeah, getting it right. So just completely squeezed down here by Pretzel, right? Pretzel's taking almost two thirds of the board at this point. Yeah, Pretzel does not play around. Um, and I'm excited to see Pretzel so high because Pretzel didn't enter day one. Like if you've got a bit of a grinder snake, there's an advantage to entering as early as possible. So you can kind of climb up the ranks as high as possible. Um, but Pretzel just kind of came in and just like, shot up this leaderboard a uh, very a very dominant uh, uh snake strategy the emoji advantage this is also one of the new snake heads right like isn't this isn't this one of our um new spring league heads that you unlock let's check on the prizes tab it's, it's not that wasn't sneaky was it it's a scary, yeah, this is totally sneaky. It's a scary head. I don't know why. It's a little intimidating. I'm yeah, <laughs> it's good stuff. It's good stuff. So fantastic. So this is that's a little bit of neater snake in action. I mean, definitely a worthy snake to be considering. Definitely a snake worthy to be examining their strategy um, and try to understand what's going on. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what their strategy is and what I was able to get. And like just a question for chat. Did anyone, did you prep? like me did anyone like grab the paper and, and read it or are you ready for like nerdy story time with aurora here is that is that what we're here for <laughs> definitely definitely let me know if you have uh uh read the paper um <laughs> but um at a high level what their strategy appears to be is they're using and they called this a variant and i had trouble finding um, information that like really clearly explained to me the difference, but they're using a min max variant that they called max, like max N it's like max to the power of N. Um, and they linked to a couple other research papers that uh, explain that, that I didn't quite, um, uh, didn't get quite a chance to dig into. So they do a, a min max variant and that's what's happening when there's multiple snakes on the board. So if they have like three, four or up to eight, 
Um, once again, in context, uh, at the Victoria event at the time that the snake was first built, we had boards start with eight. And then once you get down to the 1v1 situation, it switches to a pretty aggressive alpha beta pruning scheme, which you which you could only really do when there are only two players. So um, that's like their optimization. And that's what makes me believe that 1v1 is truly where this snake shines um, and is, is really going to be um, uh, the strongest. And, and, and it doesn't surprise me to see it so high in the leaderboard right now because of that. Um, so the other big theme to this research paper, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, I'll try to explain what MinMax does and why we care about this, is really about reducing the space complexity and all of the different techniques they use to try and make it so that they could get as deep as possible in the um, search tree and get as much information as possible in the short response time requirements that we have with Battlesnake. So your response has to come back in, in 500 milliseconds or less. Um, and then they used some sort of like distance metrics, they used flood fill um, and some sort of like other locality measurements um, and some heuristics to try and, and make decisions on this tree. So um, let's start with MinMax and what MinMax is all about. And MinMax is a great place to start diving into this because this is the like the classic game um, machine learning algorithm uh, status here. Cool. Thanks, Nessa Grav. Yeah, I'm flying solo today right now, so I appreciate the help. You are a champion. Um, so taking a look at MinMax, it's essentially going to be building up um, a, a tree and trying to minimize the damage. That's kind of where like the, the MinMax aspect come in. So um, this is like <laughs> this is like a, a, a very like code aspect, but it's a, a recursive function. So a recursive function, uh, if anyone doesn't know, is where a function calls itself over and over again, and it kind of like loops in on itself until it reaches an end condition and can kind of like bubble up back to the top. So you'll you'll start by sort of like looking for a, a maximum success and then bounce to a minimum and go back and forth. So this 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 blog post, which focuses on chess, which is a classic application, um, provided a good explanation. Um, I found. Let's see if I can find like the good. Here we go. So just sort of this like tree. So if you can imagine like the initial Battlesnake board state is where you start. You have everyone on the board. And then at this point, all the possibilities open up. So if I crack open even one of uh, Nieder's games here, at this point, we have a lot of options. So Prusy could go up, left, or right. We know they can't go down because that would go back into themselves. So they have three options. Um, Nieder can go up, you know, left, down. All of this is fine. And this isn't too bad when we're just looking at two players and two um, snakes on the board. But as soon as you have more, the different possible combinations really kind of <laughs> like really explodes. And what we're trying to do with a min max is like we're trying to get as far down into all the possibilities. So if you think one branch is like, what would happen if I went left and my opponent went right? What would happen if I went left and my opponent went up? What would happen if I went left and my opponent went left? And trying to evaluate at each level, what are the possibilities and are any of those a bad state or a losing state? That's kind of, <laughs> that's, that's what we're looking for. And we want to avoid those losing states. But this tree just gets exponentially larger on two aspects. One, which is how deep we go, because chess has has a, a fairly measurable number of moves. It's still huge. It's still really, really big. Um, but Battlesnake, once you add multiple snakes, you're like, what if player A turns left? What if player B turns left? What if player C turns left and I turn right? And it just explodes out. Um, and the, the branches and getting the depth is impossible. And... Um, when you're trying to see like what results like look as far ahead in the future as possible, the, the computational time to actually process this gets crazy. Um, yeah, Exagon's noticing like during end games when there's fewer directions per turn, <laughs> yeah, the latency just drops because they don't have to go so deep, right? The possibility and the problem space shrinks, so they're able to make these decisions quicker. And with people running a min-max strategy, this is the the battle that they are constantly fighting is how do I draw a tree that goes deep enough, that kind of looks far enough into the future and will warn me if turning left now is five, six, 10 moves from now gonna result in my demise. <laughs> like how do they do that? Um, 
uh, when they're fighting with how much time they have to actually calculate the tree when there's just so many incredible branches. And yeah, it depends on how deep you allow your snake to go through. You can just keep, yeah, you can just keep calculating future turns. So that's a strategy I've heard where like you just keep calculating future turns. You don't um, do it all at once. Um, and that's, that's a really interesting and very cool optimization. And this is like, you can't just slap in min max, you know, like, I don't know, I, I, I'm in Python, uh, I'm a Python developer. So you just like, I don't know, import numpy and like <laughs> grab the min max function. Like you have to think about how this applies to the game and how it can differ. Um, and how deep you can go in a reasonable amount of time is, is a challenge, um, I was looking at, I was reading, I was reading the, the MinMax uh, Wikipedia page here, hang on. And there was something like, you need to like almost ground yourself in reality because you, when you're reading this, you're like, oh, what's, what's like, what's expected, what's necessary. And um, here it is, Deep Blue. So Deep Blue, which was, uh, is a computer built by IBM. Uh, it's an artificial intelligence machine and it very famously, um, was played in like a chess competition, um, but the number of layers down, like how far it could look ahead was, this is in here, 12, <laughs> was 12 layers. So even with this like heavy computational computer in a game that only has two players. So like Battlesnake, I would argue is more complex than chess because um, if you're trying to accommodate the situation of having multiple snakes on the board, like if deep blue can go down to 12, that's like, that's like dang good. That kind of like puts you into reality, um, because it is not able to fully produce the tree on every turn either. So that's, that, that really kind of helps to sort of like ground you in reality about like what is possible and what is reasonable, um, and motivate you to try and like get as close to that as possible. Cool. So taking a look um, at the research paper, what I found was like, well, how do they, how do they tackle this? Because obviously they're, they're doing well um, and they're doing more than just the bare minimum to get min max operating. So they did a lot of optimization and the paper talks a lot about ways they were able to prune the tree, like really aggressively, <laughs> like how can they remove possibilities so that instead of having a huge, like really, really wide tree, they're able to cut it off. Um, and, and that's, that's where the, the max N comes in. And I think, I think, and if someone could verify this or read the follow-up research paper on max N, max N does an interesting thing where I believe the way it's supposed to work is it does for like eight, all eight boards on the snake, it would kind of like run two player mini games and produce multiple trees and then kind of like squash them together and combine them to make a decision rather than trying to do like all eight simultaneously. So that seemed to be the variant max N that they used uh, to optimize it. And if anyone can confirm or clarify or produce a better explanation, I'd be welcome to it, but that's how I think it works. <laughs> Um, equal in terms of complexity, because in chess, there are 16 pieces you can move at months where Battlesnake. That's a good point, actually. 16 pieces and like how many of those are unique with different moves, um, where in Battlesnake, you can only move one piece, but you have many more opponents. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and <laughs> I think someone in Discord uh, in chat was, um, I don't want to say complaining, but it, it looked like they'd, they'd realized that when you start looking at game variants in Battlesnake, it kind of like throws everything out the window. Like you have to completely re-optimize if you're using a min-max strategy for like Royale or for squads, like these extra layers of complexity and these variants like really mean you have to work hard to convert your snake to work for that mode. Max N is the opposite of pruning. It's meant to consider all N players instead of just two. Yeah, so it like explodes out the tree um, and then pops that back in. Pruning based on locality. I'm glad you mentioned that because that is exactly what uh, this research paper describes is how they prune based on locality. Um, so the 1v1 situation, they bounce down to classic alpha beta pruning. So like very vanilla, you're in a two player mode. This is how most, most ch chess spots it seems work. Um, but for pruning in a battle snake situation, they, it looks like they experimented with um, three different kind of ways of like ignoring snakes on the board. Um, so either they would pretend they didn't exist at all. So if they were too far away, 
just pretend they don't exist, especially in the early game, because a snake in the top left hand corner and you're in the bottom right, it isn't really going to matter what they do. So you just ignore all of those movesets um, and just like focus on your own little box of reality. Um, so they experimented with removing the snake altogether. They experimented with like freezing the snake. So in your data structure, instead of trying to um, like predict a move for that snake, you just kind of freeze it which apparently worked a little better because when you remove a snake entirely, especially closer to the end game, even if you're far away, that it doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't like really filling a space or maybe blocking an exit. Um, so removing them entirely, they, they said, predictably had terrible results. Um, so freezing a snake is, is one strategy and freezing they really liked. So in, in when you're calculating the next move, you just like pretend that that snake didn't move instead of trying to like guess a moderately okay move um, just to save time, it, it seemed what it, it was gonna really be. Yeah, battle snake and chesses that moves happen simultaneously, totally. Um, definitely reading into that and how MinMax is, um, I don't wanna say optimized, but it's definitely designed with the idea of alternating turns um, in mind. Um, and you can sort of simulate that, like you can kind of make it work, but you're right, moves actually happen simultaneously. And that means when you're actually evaluating a layer, um, and I believe the correct term for this is like your, your heuristic as it were. So your heuristic for evaluating your set of moves has to take that into consideration that the moves actually happen simultaneously. Um, very cool. Oh, done with min-max if you use payoff matrices instead of a single payoff value, but it makes it very difficult to do A-B pruning. Yes, and, and this is so important because like pruning, you wanna make it as quick and as um, easy as possible. So removing any snakes that are too far away is a, a stand, is a really good strategy for doing that. Cool. Um, awesome. So alpha beta pruning, just to kind of give like a quick, quick overview for anyone in chat. Obviously we have some folks who are like on this, they have been thinking about this. They've been applying these concepts to their Battlesnake games. Um, but for anyone who, um, uh, would like a bit more of an explanation on what alpha beta pruning is, it's an optimization that you can do in, in two player games where you just like entirely remove a branch and all of its children of possibility. So all of those features are just cut off. Um, so what you do is you stop, you stop evaluating as you're like calculating each, each layer. So if one went left and one went right, and then you're, you know, thinking of all possible next steps after that. Um, once you find a possibility that is worse than any possibility that you've looked at before, like it's, it's in a bad state, you just like, cut it like as soon as you can kind of compare two nodes in your tree at the same level and you're like oh that one's bad you just don't bother continuing to calculate further down into the futures um oh hey andrew <laughs> i have arrived you know like that supporting character who arrives and uh and you're like oh man i hope they're gonna add something to the stream that person is here. Yes, Nessa Grab, I'm here. I did realize though that I also caused serious like random spam damage in the middle of this thing as I like clicked on something to try and get it to disappear on the stream. And I think our viewers were seeing like a random spam message that was up there. So- um, Oh, is that you? <laughs> that was me. So I'm gonna take the full blame for that. Just add a little bit of color to, uh, to our deep learning sessions. I'm so sorry for being so late i just jumped off another stream to be here but i'm so <laughs> thrilled to be here um to be looking at our amazing paper today to hang out with all of you our amazing viewers i'm super yeah. stoked to be here yeah no it's good times and i'm like stoked that chat is here because there are a lot of people in chat who have dove <laughs> dove a little deeper than i had an opportunity to like get into some of these topics um, so Andrew, to catch you up, we've been talking about the tree structure um, for, for what MinMax is and how we're calculating the future. We've talked about how um, Battlesnake has this added complexity of having so many snakes on the board, like usually in most popular machine learning applications, like when people are using this algorithm on chess or backgammon or other similar games, um, you know, you're only dealing with two players. Um, but as chat pointed out, I, I made a bold claim. I made a bold claim and I suggested that maybe Battlesnake was more complex. Um, however, it was, I was correctly, uh, <laughs> it was correctly pointed out to me that there are fewer move possibilities with a snake, right? You can only go left, right, yep. up or down. Um, where with like chess, there's different pieces that can move in many different ways. 
Um, so, you know, it's interesting. And so we were just talking about alpha beta pruning, <laughs> you know, some light, some light, light conversation, light conversation. So just, <laughs> uh, I, I also love that I'm going to be nodding and smiling through much of this really deep learning is here just for me. It's so that <laughs> I can learn these things and our, obviously our community is very important, but I will ask all of the dumb questions, um, that you may be afraid to ask. I will ask all of them. Yeah. So small scope bringing up. So like one of the one of the challenges in applying the min-max um, algorithm is that it does kind of assume that the way a game works is player A goes, player B goes, then player A goes, which is not true in Battlesnake. In Battlesnake, everyone takes their turn simultaneously. Um, so you can like kind of stack it. You can produce your tree with that lie in mind, I guess, uh, assuming everyone. But what it comes down to is the the, the heuristic. Once you're at the decision making point, you you're going to have to accommodate that um, because otherwise you're looking at things like head on collisions or um, a classic, which is eating a piece of food and then being too long and no longer fitting where you are. Um, all of these kinds of things can kind of happen. Um, so, <laughs> um, so we've talked about pruning and removing like possible futures from our consideration to save computational time. Cause that's, that's really the challenge. Um, and, um, uh, this is like, once you set up the sort of min max and maybe a, a pruning strategy, um, for trying to like be able to predict further, like more and more steps in the, the future, the next piece that you really need to work on if you're building a, a snake with min max is the heuristic, which is the like, how are you going to decide? However deep you go in your sort of forward predictions, how are you going to decide what you're going to do? Um, Nessie Grove saying, you move, they move, leads my snake to believe that a 50-50 situation is lost. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like that is that is totally a challenge. And you have to like, like code accommodate for that and take into account like how long are you? How long are they? Is there, is there food involved? Um, and you're going to need a little extra time to calculate that too, right? Like you can't spend all your time building your tree layers. <laughs> Tempting though that may be. Um, so... Did you see the question from Twoten in there? How do you deal right with the how do you deal with food in Minmax? Do you branch on food spawn or no spawn? I wish I had a quick answer for you, but I don't. Uh, chat, shall we discuss? Don't predict food spawns. Yeah. I so reading, let me let me look at my notes here. Search for the word food, because they did talk about this. So in in the research paper for neuter snake they talked about room for improvement and like things that they wishes wish were different and they noticed that they didn't really take like length into account um and also had trouble with that head-on-head -head collision and also had that 50 50 split um and they didn't work with food a ton because that's like a random variable that just really doesn't work in a min max formula calculation like it's expecting discrete moves and adding that much randomness is kind of um, tricky um, and trying to predict whether or not food is or is not present just like really explodes your tree it, it does the opposite thing instead of pruning we're now adding even more branches of possibility of what if food appears in the next couple of moves um, so they they didn't like really do zero it looks like they put in checks to ensure that there wasn't starvation and if they were at a certain health level and they could see food somewhere in their future and it was you know a safe-ish direction they'd go for it um, but, um, that part of the evaluation that was tricky, was tricky, man. There's yeah. like some solid Twitch chat going on right now. I'm digging it. Yes. And Hey, by the way, hello everybody. Cause everybody said hi earlier. Hey, Extagon. Hey, Nessagram. I love, I got exclamation marks when I arrived. That makes, <laughs> yes. me, happy. That makes me happy. I'm going to contribute very little to this session. Um, but I will do something to earn those exclamation points. Yeah, small scope is like I assume food never spawns when building future stakes, but I keep current existing food in place. Yeah, that's. I mean, I there's only so much one can do with min max, and I, I kind of wonder like, when you're dealing with machine learning algorithms, like they are strong and they're designed for a purpose, and like there kind of comes a point in my opinion where you're like trying to accommodate so many edge cases, and you're trying to get it to like fit. It's like you got a, you've got like, what is that like square, but it's like twisted. Um, you're trying to fit 
a rhombus and a square hole. Like it's just not quite working. Um, and it, and then you start to kind of lose the benefits of the algorithm. So I, I almost feel like there's there's got to be a different approach. Like if you want to really, really take food into consideration, um, there might be other other approaches. Perfect is the enemy of good. True, right? Like the random's going to happen. It's going to be okay. Cool. <laughs> Cool. So um, taking a look at Neater Snake's um, uh, implementation as of the 2019, um, they they really noted, um, <laughs> they, they called it the territorial advantage. So their snake was like trying to maximize its territorial advantage. So like getting long and um, and and taking up as much space as possible, but it didn't really do a great job of using its length. And I can kind of imagine those situations where you're just like, you're maybe filling up in kind of more of a corner rather than trying to like slice through the middle of the board. Um, I think, was it this game? Um, just running a game really quickly. But one of the games we were watching earlier where you could see that like, Neater Snake was like in the last third of the board and, and uh, Pretzel had done a much better job of kind of like, no, like this is my line, this is where I'm going. Um, so when you have that length, like making sure to throw it around and, and use it um, is really good. Percentage of games lost by food spawning is too low to bother. Yeah, I mean, it happens, it's tragic, but um, you know, it also doesn't happen <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Cool. So length advantage, um, they used um, a, a fill flutter. So I love, I love fill flood. When you're like doing machine learning research or trying to like dig your way through a research paper and become familiar with algorithms or terminology, you're um, maybe not familiar with. Um, so the whole the whole paper is basically what you're saying. So, yeah. so if I if I am trying to learn this as I read through, and just for everybody in the audience, as I read through this and and read things, I recognized how much I do not understand about machine learning. Um, <laughs> so I'm a perfect person to be here. Yeah, there we go. So flood fill. I did that. I did that search earlier today. Yeah, and don't you just love this visual? I mean, here's something you can count on that I learned uh, fairly early on is that the internet is full of nerds. I don't know if you folks know that, but it's true. <laughs> um, so like if you're looking for technical terminology or or like algorithmic information, there's just like so many great pages, even on Wikipedia that have like great visualizations. And once flood fill was expa explained as like, no, this is literally the algorithm you use when you're using the paint icon to like, Phil. I was like, oh, that makes so much sense. <laughs> um, so there's no shame in doing a good old fashioned Wikipedia search to look something up. Also, I do enjoy Whitish Meteor's uh, recent uh, chat post. When I lose a game to a food spawn, <laughs> I just blame Brad instead of my algorithm. That's really that most of us do, actually. Uh, yeah. That's that's part of the game. It's it it's in the new updated docs, actually. Um, yeah. Don't blame yourself. Blame blame Brad. I mean, he is the one of us who touches the game engine the most. It's true. Um, so you know. His fingers in that pie is what I'm saying. You know, if they come out <laughs> covered in berry juice, like who are you gonna blame? <laughs> there's a there's a quotable in there. There's a t-shirt that's gonna come. Everybody gets a t-shirt, and I feel like if, if if you stick your finger in and berry juice comes out, probably yeah. Brad's fault. Probably Brad's fault. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Anyways, back to the important stuff that we're here for. So flood yeah. fill. Yeah, so they used they used um, flood fill as a part just to sort of like figure out like what territory was theirs, and um, I'm, I'm gonna try to switch into. It's the research paper is on a PDF rather than a. Um, do do so. Let me let me just play around here with screen sharing. Sorry about that. Share. I'm, I'm on screen, I'm realizing that my green screen is not as good as I wanted it to be. Oh, oh there we go, more there important things. Yeah, so this was their section on how they were taking advantage of, of, of the flood fill, essentially. Um, so um, as they say, I'm zoomed in a lot here. Um, so their flood fill algorithm, so they start, start with each snake's head position and kind of sort themselves by snake length. Um, and since the snake head moves in one of the directions adjacent to the four tiles around you, um, they use the diamond flood filler and it kind of ensures that the snake kind of take turns filling it out. So you can kind of imagine that paint can starting at each snake head, right? <laughs> About like, where could they possibly go? 
Um, and they chose with the largest snake to kind of have the advantage because it's it's larger. So in the event that you got to, I'm going to call this disputed border territory, which are these starred ones. So technically in this diagram, both A and B could reach the starred ones, but because B is the larger snake, that territory belongs to them because if they met it at the same time in a head-on collision, B would win. B is the larger snake. Um, so that was sort of one technique that they used to try and predict or accommodate for like that head-on collision, um, which is like, even though technically you could reach a square because you're the smaller snake, that's, that square is not yours for the having, as it were. Um, so um, Phil, Phil Method returns the tiles that a snake can reach before um, any other snake can um, and uh, lets you know which, which tiles, which areas you kind of have better control of. So that's, this, is, this is a really great visual. Um, props for <laughs> good... Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah. Good, good diagrams. Yeah, I feel like this is one of the things that's not understood enough. Like, there's so many academic papers that you read that are trying to explain some of these complex concepts, and they do it just like fully textually. Like, there's more of I, I can start to understand this adversarial flood fill concept through <laughs> that graphic that's there, and I think that, like, I think that speaks to why this paper. I mean, obviously, there's not a huge amount of battle snake research out there, but why this is such a thing that we're happy to share out there with the world and talk about in detail. Totally, totally. You can't go wrong with a good visual. You can't go wrong with a good visual. Sweet. So, like, our so this this kind of goes through the heuristic. This talks about the the fill and how they're kind of making decisions about like tile advantage and opportunities. Um, another aspect that they did, and you can, we'll take a look at this in the, the code. We'll like pop in there again in a moment. Um, but in order to sort of tweak this, because all of these, all of these formulas, this is the other part of machine learning, which is fun, is that you have all of these like parameters that you then have to tweak to fit your situation. Cause any machine learning algorithm is not a one size fits all. You have to like tweak and, and make it appropriate for your selection. Um, which is something I learned the hard way in my natural language natural language processing days is um, people would write these algorithms and write these research papers about how well something processed text and they had only ever run it on like data from academic papers because those were free and easy to get in large quantities and then you take that same model and that same algorithm and apply it to something like blog posts and tweets and it would do terrible because the style of writing and like the language structure that you see in an academic paper is very different than the type that you see in like modern contemporary um, um, written language. Like things like slang is just terrible or like we use verbs for nouns and nouns for verbs and that really like that really throws the poor computer for a loop as it were. So um, what uh, Niedersnake spent a lot of time doing is like running a lot of self-play games against common battle snake archetypes like you know like the chicken snake tail follow or like a really aggressive snake that's going for head on head or like a really really hungry snake um so that was the other components oh NLP made a good point there like nlp like natural language processing stuff is mostly in english right so it depends actually i remember oh, okay. going to this conference and having this um opportunity to speak I'll speak to a lot of like chinese or indian researchers um, and I, I realized that I became quite jealous because in other languages, things like identifying a proper noun or um, whether or not a word is gendered, because in English, we don't have yeah. a lot of gendered words. But like in French, for example, you do. It, it was funny because like obviously in computer science, there's a lot of, of research in English and there's a lot of content online that's in English. But it was amazing seeing the research in other languages because problems that were difficult in English could be easier in a different language and vice versa. <laughs> it was really weird and funny. And um, I, I developed like a, a deep dislike for the English language, which is the only language that I myself speak. <laughs> it's just it's so badly structured. It's so tricky. Yeah, it's um, true. And I love butchering it as well. But we like make up words and add them in or like verbify nouns or nounify verbs. Or crane, crane, and crane is a favorite one. Crane can be a bird, like a bird, the bird, the crane. It could be a construction vehicle, or it could be like craning your neck. <laughs> and like, how do you tell it's the true. difference? true. <laughs> totally. NLP for the snake shout. Yeah, need an NLP powered snake. <laughs> shout Somebody. intent parsing. Yeah. 
Somebody will there. You know that our community is so fantastic that like after this, somebody will do that. Like that's what I love most about Battlesnake is just that a funny concept will go out into the world that is also like technically challenging, and then it will it, it will show up somewhere. So mm. I love it. I nice. love it. <laughs> cool. Very cool. So are there any components, are there any aspects, Andrew, in your investigation, in your reading that you were like, this is interesting or this is confusing? Like what, what parts caught your eye? I'm very, I'm very curious. So here's what I wondered when I was reading through. So most of this, like I can glean little bits from, but I, I guess I struggled as like this let's consider me a very novice software developer. I, I know my way around GitHub, uh, if, if you could say that. Um, but I struggled to figure out like, where are the things that somebody who's a newer developer can really take out of this and, um, and get some value from this paper? Because, and I think there's one thing like, um, Nesikrev said something that I'm just showed up on the screen, like reading an ac academic paper can boost your depth of understanding of a concept, like totally, like I totally agree with that. So even just reading this, like gets you thinking of some of these concepts, but from your perspective, Aurora, like if somebody's a newer Battlesnake developer and they're interested in this and they want to glean something out of it, like what's kind of the core or what's a kind of core piece that you think they should focus on? Right. So oddly enough, and this is true in all data science work that I've ever done, whether it's like natural language processing, or I did some like predictive grouping stuff. I worked for a digital advertising company for a while, and we were trying to like predict what ads would best match with, with people. It was, it was an interesting job. It was an interesting job. Um, and the number one piece of advice is to actually like get in there and get familiar with your data. Before you start throwing algorithms and trying to get solutions in there, I actually recommend starting at the basics and be like, okay, how do I like hand code a snake? Because that gets you the intimacy you need to understand all of the edge cases and the situations and to like, as a human, start recognizing the pattern. Um, Cause humans are pretty good at identifying or recognizing or getting a feel for, for patterns, even if we, don't fully understand it. <laughs> um, so I really think that that's actually truly the first snake. I would recommend if you want to build a machine learning snake to actually build a hand snake first, because that's where you start to get the comfort with like, okay, what does a food spawn situation look like? What does a head on head collision look like? What does it look like where my snake is positioned? Like how, how am I at an advantage when I'm the largest snake? And how am I at a disadvantage when I'm the largest snake? So you get kind of like clumsy and can more easily trip in on yourself. Um, but if you're just like plugging in libraries of machine learning algorithms without that context, it's, you can kind of, you can get yourself in trouble and then you're not sure how to tune or tweak it or to optimize. Uh, that's that's definitely my opinion. I don't know if, if others have thoughts on this. How did how did other people dive into building their own machine learning snakes or start experimenting with these algorithms? Yeah, that's true. Like who in the chat had I, I listen, I know there's some of the people. We've got some of our our battle snake aficionados that are that I'm sure have built them, but maybe there's some that will surprise us in the chat. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we're still on the shout thing. We're just like analyze I those. We're going, back, we're, going back, we're going backwards. It's all right. This listen, you follow what the audience wants. That's the thing of that's like the, the mission of live streaming, right? We plan yeah. to deep dive into a paper, but we are going to be focusing on how we can really navigate into doing something cool with shouts. I love yeah. it. Well, I, I really think that it's an error to believe that the only way to win Battle Snake is to be the last snake remaining. There are many ways one can win Battle Snake with a wonderful theme pack. We've seen that a lot with some really bold moves. Like, um, I keep thinking of like, all I need is 60 milliseconds. Like, it doesn't matter if you win. If you throw out, like, throw down the glove like that, you you are winning uh, in my heart. So, <laughs> shout emotes, yeah. <laughs> Log out and add them to the authorized list to be on the stream. Whew, whew. I am not looking forward to the uh, profanity filters uh, that I would have to. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of natural language processing problems, that's like. 
what I learned doing a lot of natural language processing is that your best profanity filter is probably just a list of blacklisted words. <laughs> there you go. See the things you learn when you're doing this <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis. Rough and simple. I, I think Smallsco said it earlier, is that like perfect is, is the enemy of good. So <laughs> for the record, 61 milliseconds were needed. That's true. I saw that on SnakeFit Live. We definitely saw some 61 millisecond response times in there. So <laughs> So the other thing, because I, I dove in and I know we, I, I'm sure that you've already started to look at the code that's associated with this, but I'm interested if like we can see some of these concepts in practice, because I think that's the other side of it is right. Like a lot of like you can see it on the paper and you read about it, but what does it look like when you're building a snake with it? That is a great idea. Okay, let me let me grab my. Uh, here we go. Do do. So here's 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 goodbye Floodfield goodbye my comrade my my crutch Wikipedia. Bye Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> oh hold on. Uh, so Extagon, I remember having trouble with research. Oh hold on, let's put it up on the screen so everybody can read it. Yeah. Uh, I remember having trouble research papers. I found an article how to read a research paper, a free course on Coursera, learning how to learn. That's a very meta course to take. Learn about learning that. how to learn. That is such a deep learning sentiment. If you if you've got the link for that Extagon for that that paper that had tips on how to approach learning, I would love to throw that in chat. Um, Cause yeah, you go slow. Like my process, um, and I've I've done this on paper, and I'm exploring now with the digital tablet. Is like I read it the first time, and I don't do anything, and I just try. Like my goal isn't even to understand the details; it's to try and understand like the skeleton of the paper, like, okay, at this part, they kind of talk about the algorithm. In this part, they talk about the heuristic. In this part, they talk about the improvements. Like you sort of start to find the skeleton and then I go through again and I start highlighting things I need to look up, like words or algorithms. Even if I'm like, a, like I think I know what they mean, I double check. <laughs> uh, Cause you know, I, I'm not a great memorizer. So I always want to like look up and be sure. Um, as long ago, link to the learning how to learn course. Yes, please do. Please do. We're all here for learning. It's good. <laughs> so I love, thank you to everybody. Cause I know you're not all on like our beautiful West coast time where it's like super, not that crazy late. So if you're tuning in from somewhere where it's like a ridiculously weird time of day, um, thank you for staying up with us or getting up early with us and learning about some awesome, um, research and doing a deep dive into learning um we're super pumped to have you here mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very much so <laughs> yay all right now we get to see what it looks like in practice and i'm gonna look at this and i'll nod and smile a lot as though i know what's going on um but i'm nodding and smiling for everybody out there yeah so i have to say there was when i when i first started looking at the code i was a little disappointed because i was really hoping after reading this explanation I was really hoping I would find like literally a function called maximize and literally a function called minimize. I was like really hoping I'd find that and help it would help like anchor me in the code. Um, essentially, especially since like C++ is not is not my jam. Um, there's way too many objects and files in this for me. Um, uh, <laughs> for, for, for poor, poor Python dominant Aurora here. Um, so I was hoping to find like this, this pseudocode. I was hoping to find it in code. Um, but I did find some kind of familiar um, points. Here we go. So here's here's the code base. And once again, note, this isn't like, this isn't the live Nessa Gre Grove Snake. This is like 2019 um, sanitized version for this research paper. Um, but uh, I was able to pop in here. So AI seemed very promising. <laughs> it does. Uh, yeah. And this was really great because they, they did a wonderful job naming. If this was like last deep learning stream, um, I would be giving this a pretty high evaluation as a code sample, actually. Because it, oh, okay. yeah, it, wasn't, it wasn't too bad. Um, so we can see here, this is their alpha beta pruning section. So we, we talked about that, how um, in... In more than two player mode, they were dealing with, you know, the min max and sort of the max end and kind of like just dealing with distance and, and pruning the tree that way. And then you can see, I, I'll have to find the, the place again. So here's here's their max end strategy code right here. Um, so this is this is the bit, lots of objects and lots of um, structs here. 
um, to sort of like figure out, okay, what's the result? How do we keep, you know, deepening the search, all of the lists, all of the nodes in the tree, all of the snakes having to be simulated and making predictions on what move could they be and what would be the board state. So we find their max n code here and uh, their alpha beta pruning. So this is what they would switch to um, when they were down to the like 1v1 situation. Do you think this would still run if you use Smallsco's Mojave tool? I don't know. I'm not sure if, does that still support API v, v0? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, it did, no, it does. I am 98.5% sure that it does, that he set it up to use it. <laughs> if you can compile and run it locally. There you go. Boom. Perfect. Perfect. Nice. So so we have that component. Um, there's definitely some, some functions here. So deepening the search. And I'm trying to remember where primary agent. Here we go. Here we go. So this is kind of like the uh, root of it, I guess. So what I'm seeing here is there's the alpha beta heuristic producer and here's the max n heuristic producer. So this is the location where they're deciding like, oh, am I in a multi snake situation? Am I in a 1v1 snake situation? Um, and deciding, you know, which one like being ready to do both. Um, oh, that was another small optimization they described in the paper, which I thought was very clever um, and something that could use. So even in a like multi-snake situation, if the other snakes were far enough away, they would actually briefly switch to alpha beta pruning and pretend the other snakes, snakes didn't exist so that they could go a little bit deeper. So you get better moves out of meter snake if like, if if it can get you alone, basically that's what it comes down to. Like meter <laughs> snake is the snake you don't want to like walk down a dark alley with, because when it's alone, it switches into its alpha beta, and is able to um, do a lot more. Um, I think how I had some notes. It does say in the paper like how deep they were able to go in each mode. Where did I write it? I wish I wrote it down. I'll hope if I see it in my notes, I will I will let you know. But if I remember correctly, it was something like four or five with max n and they were able to get to like seven or eight i think with alpha beta so if they were able to kind of like corner an opponent uh, and only focus on it they would like switch up to alpha beta and just get a little bit more depth get a little bit more accuracy in their predictions um and really do that yeah i'm just looking for it but uh i cannot find it does it talk about what computation they give no it doesn't um I mean, I suspect they were running this on, I want to say they're running this on university servers, but they're not like, we all know that the Battlesnake servers are in, in, in US West Oregon. Um, so latency can be a problem there. So I don't think the paper says it. That's a good question. Have to corner, <laughs> have to corner the Neuter Snake team and uh, uh, find out what they were doing, whether they were using um, cloud computing. I feel like they might've, spun up some AWS instances though. Doesn't it say in the paper what they were using? I feel like it did, but maybe not. And it's not super important right now anyways. I'm not Sweet. installation okay. and running. I don't think so. It's just the strategy. Oh, no. Yeah, I don't think it's here. Cool. Um, but yeah, well, well laid out um, project. We've got their heuristics here. So this is some of their like, decision-making optimization in the moment. And you can start seeing a bit like base dueling heuristics. So like dealing with like making different types of decisions and choices when you're down to just a 1v1 situation versus like a different heuristic algorithm, a different choice when you're in like a multi, excuse me, a multi-snake situation. Um, so really kind of divided this up and dealing with the different states of the game, um, especially because in 2019, we tend to run like eight snake games and then a <laughs> lot snake standing. Um, so very interesting, interesting breakdown in here. Um, and the other component that I thought was neat, was it, where was it? They, they have some of the code for... Was it API model? No, this is just your standard, um, like what is the board? What is the directions? Of course, switching it from the JSON blob to like a, a more performant data structure. Um, but there's definitely, there's definitely a section where it's got the snakes that they tested with and the snakes that they kind of like built up 
is snake is instance. Ah, I've lost it. Heuristic metrics. Wasn't an agents, was it? Um, oh, here we go. Yeah, hunger, pressure, advantage. I think I think these are it. So the different kind of snakes that they use to sort of like train and um, run a whole bunch of scenarios and kind of tweak some of the parameters um, against some common snake patterns. And I thought this was interesting too because I am a big fan of random snakes. Like, like if someone's building a tree, right? If they're doing like a min max and they're building a tree, and especially if the way they're building the tree is instead of like freezing the snake, they're trying to predict what the opponent is most likely to do. That kind of assumes that your opponent is behaving in some sort of rational way, <laughs> right? <laughs> and if you are a bit of a chaos snake, I think you can be a bit of a problem. Like you want to be like a look ahead chaos snake, but if you act like just a little bit erratically or really switch up your strategy, um, I, I think those can be a little bit of trouble sometimes um, because there's only so much modeling you can do or predictions based on like common snake patterns. Um, so I don't know, this, this just makes me more fond of chaos snakes. <laughs> Cool. But yeah, this is the code. It's all here visible. Um, if you are comfortable with C++, uh, this is public. It's on GitHub. Um, I'll post the link again in chat. Uh, but this is this is Neater Snake uh, circa, you know, 2019. So yeah, I mean, let us know if you liked the content of, of the show so far. Um, like we're super excited. And and if you've got questions or content or comments on stuff that you want us to kind of dig into with, with the paper or today or, or later, like let us know in the chat. Yeah. What did you what did you learn on this journey, Andrew? Uh what did I learn on the journey? That you shouldn't schedule two streams at once when you are examining an intense research paper that you are not a computer scientist and don't understand. But but I learned what flood fill actually is and how it works. And I learned that I will not be able to implement it in any of my snakes because currently the only thing my snakes can do is go around in a very large circle until they die. So I'm not, I'm not there yet, but, but actually I will say the thing that I am going to take away from this is actually to do more with the data that's there. Cause I'm not using it right now. All, my snake is basically just in survival mode, but I haven't, dug deep into what I can actually do with the data. And I, I feel like four or five days, just like sitting down, I'll be, um, I'll be implementing everything that's here in this repo. I'll be, I'll be figuring out how Minimax is going to help me move up the chain. Listen, I'm in seven. I think I moved up because we had some more people that moved in that are worse than me on the leaderboard. <laughs> so, um, I feel like maybe over the weekend I'll I'll read uh, I'll I'll start to implement this I'll brush up on my C plus plus and mm -hmm. and we're good to go. Yeah, I mean I I definitely learned like min max seems like such the obvious choice right like there's so much research written about it it's it's such a popular machine learning algorithm like for as long as we've had computers people have been trying to program computers to play games right that's like that's what we've been doing um and i really reading this paper i really started to appreciate the subtlety of the battlesnake problem and the sort of sub problems that are in there along with like wow your tree's really expanding you only have so much computational time and one of the things I love about Battlesnake is it's a chance to explore learning areas. So if you're kind of in the intermediate zone of your like programming journey, Battlesnake gives you chances to try new programming language, to try new like CI, like deployment pipelines. You get a chance to learn about like servers and you know, everyone hits that point where they're just like, ah oh, man, my free like Heroku instance is just not cutting it anymore. Like what's my next step? Um, but for this, this really starts to get into some like meaty computer science problems that you can dig into. Like, how do I deal with my tree complexity? How do I optimize my code to make it run fast enough to get more depth? Um, how do I like make the problem smaller, like by cutting branches of the tree? Um, it just made me appreciate the beauty of the complexity and how much fun there is. And then the, 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 <laughs> the dismalness of having probably spent a lot of time optimizing it and then, you know, Royale mode comes in and you're like, oh, <laughs> well, that's different. This isn't going to work in that situation anymore. Not as well, at least. Um, so having to optimize for those different versions, that's, that's it's, I could appreciate the beauty a little bit. And shout out for the paper. Like if you are looking for a research paper to start reading, it's not terribly long. Um, it's like 12 pages. And remember, there's like references and preamble and things like that. 
Um, but like they very kind of like clearly lay it out. They really clearly um, establish the rules of Battlesnake, um, which is very helpful to kind of have that laid out and kind of think about it from that perspective. Um, and just kind of, you know, <laughs> appreciate like how it fit together um, and, and, and getting all the information. It wasn't too bad. A lot of the tools and techniques they're using are very common and, and very Googleable. Yeah, I was going to say, like, the nice thing about, I even I found, like, reading through it, not as the computer scientist, is it was digestible enough that I was like, okay, I can go and I can easily find out what this, this reference that they're looking at and, mm -hmm. uh, and understand a little bit more from there, so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Sweet. So, um, I, I like, there's a note from Nessa Grimm in there, and I think this is really good, like, the idea of looking at papers. It sucks that there's not very many more papers, but there's lots of blog posts about, about developer journeys, so I feel like there's maybe more to be done on this, like, investigation of the development process um, within Battlesnake in deep learning. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like, this is a challenge now. We've got one. We have prior art. Uh, if you're um, in school or know someone who's taking uh, an engineering or computer science degree and they need some sort of like project, <laughs> why not Battlesnake? Why not the Battlesnake? The challenge start, is out there. Start growing the uh, body of work on, on this topic for sure. Cool. Uh, awesome. So, I mean, we're coming, we're coming up to an hour here, um, but yeah, that was fun. What do you, what do you think? Research paper? I definitely, research paper is cool. Like, I think there's very few other, I mean, Battlesnake is unique in and of itself, but like how many other platforms or tools or games that exist like Battlesnake have, have freaking academic research, like real meaty, useful, beneficial papers that are out there. Like, I think it speaks to, I think you're right. I think I didn't learn this until you said it. But now I have learned. You're right. There's something in Battlesync for everybody. If you're a new developer who's just like learning how to program, it gives you like a visual way to represent your learning. If you're an experienced developer who's looking to implement like new concepts that you've never done before, there's a place to do that too. Um, yeah. Where's the rest of the research papers though? Yeah. What are, what are other machine learning techniques that are using? I, I, someone, I was speaking with someone like neural nets is another area, completely different machine learning strategy to take a look at. Um, it's got its own challenges, its own own uh, tricks and work in implementation. But we could definitely look at some of that. If if any of you know a lot about neural nets, I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, we could get get some content for deep learning. Uh, but yeah, I think thanks everyone for joining us on this journey. We we've tried some very different types of learning styles and topics. Um, if you have something you would love for us to deep learn on, let us know. Um, and I think a shout out shout out to our sponsors, Andrew. RBC, AWS, GitHub, and Replit, you're awesome. Check them out if you haven't already. There's some cool stuff that's going on. Um, Spring League is happening right now. It wouldn't be possible without them. So please go and show your love. If you love Battlesnake, let them know so that they can help um, help Spring League and lots of awesome things happen. Um, and make sure you engage on Discord. We are here. Um, Aurora and I are monitoring all hours of, not all hours of the day, but the <laughs> sun hours of the day we are on discord so if you do have feedback that you want to give about this or you want to chat with any of those folks they're on discord as well so um yeah huge thank you to those folks for making battle sneak possible and there's a link down that 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 way down somewhere there is a link at the bottom of your screen about spring league um and if you haven't entered which i know you all have but if you're lurking and watching and you haven't entered spring league remember even if you pre-registered you still have to enter your snake in the ladder. You have to go back in and actually enter your snake. So that's like a really important step. Um, and if you want help on doing it, um, I'm going to be on Discord like next week and I may, or like maybe tomorrow and I might actually like walk people through if they're unsure how to do it. So um, I love that we're talking about machine learning and I'm like, go click <laughs> this button to enter your snake <laughs> in the thing. Um, so if you have your machine learning snake, but you can't quite figure it out. And neater snakes at the top. So entering now, you'll be down with like Andrews and my snakes, which are much more reasonable. Not yeah. this, not looking that many moves ahead. They're very <laughs> reasonable. I can, there's one strategy where literally you can, you can take me out anytime, but it's all right. Cause I'm still there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So cool. 
That was awesome. Thanks for thanks for holding down the fort. I feel like I need to now make up because I'm I'm definitely that's two um that's two of these streams in a row where <laughs> I have really just been a beautiful talking head that's on the screen but not really contributing much. So nah, I feel like nah, the nah. next deep learning. I'm yeah. there. It's gonna you're be gonna, there. So you're gonna teach me something next, Andrew. I can there we go. So let us know in the chat or in uh, in the deep learning Discord. Let us know what you'd like to see here on deep learning. We're going to be back. What are we back for deep learning? We've got two, one more. two more weeks. I think we got yeah, we've got at least one more in another two weeks. And yeah, next another... Thursday, uh, same bat time, same bat channel is Snake Pit Live. Yeah, and this Saturday, just as the last thing, uh, Brad and Joe coding badly. Um, show up 10:30 a.m. Pacific time. It's awesome. They're going to be coding but badly uh so if you weren't quite sure what coding badly was about yeah I'll, I'll you egg them into doing min max that's that's my advice cool uh, yeah there you go yes i would love to see brad and joe try and figure out machine learning live on stream i feel like that is the that is the payest de resistance sweet all right all right thanks everyone. thanks everybody bye, bye, -bye. see you next time